actually, a couple of months ago, I was presenting the same talk to His Holiness the Dalai Lama, having his comments and uh, uh, and uh, suggestion. So, but let me go ahead if I find that. Let's see the which uh, is a term which has been used very much and not always, uh, I think, in the right uh, way. There are many books on uh, science and religion. I am a biologist and I track spirituality back in the time of uh, our ancestor. You see, when our ancestor began for the first time to walk in erect position, standing up from this position, they had, uh, you know, immediately the vision of the sky, the vision of the moon, the sunrise, th thunder and lightning, having then the uh, clear uh, sensation that there were powers in nature much stronger than man himself, powers to whom, uh, to which it was then necessary to erect altars and give sacrifice. And this for me is coming up and looking at the sky, realizing for the first time question like what is reality? Who am I? This is the origin for me of spirituality and also of uh, consciousness. And in fact I track <coughs> spirituality mostly in these two questions. People who are asking in a, a professional way, the monks, you know, our Rinpoche and our Tichnatan and whatever uh, see Nizargadatta, or also scientists who are inquiring reality, you know, really asking what is indeed reality, not the simple matter. And then the collateral question, who am I? And I wrote here for you, where is the first question I bring to the intuition of the infinite, of the thing without uh, boundaries? Also the second question, who am I, brings you to the touch of the infinite, to the touch, to the sensation that there is something also inside us which is beyond limit. And we will play a little bit uh, with science along these two questions. To me, then, as a question of definition, um, spirituality has, must have also an horizontal uh, question, the ethical, the social, the uh, morality, which uh, in most religion is expressed as love for the other. Love is probably too much, but at least respect and uh, for nature and, and people and ecology, it's important. Let me <coughs> say that instead religion which is, of course, a kind of uh, 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 spirituality, is uh, this spirituality which tendentially, not always, is bound uh, to uh, written codes, to rules, which you should not go over them, and is also bound very often to hierarchic power and political power. And uh, it's religion which gets into trouble with science, not spirituality. So that uh, science and spirituality, the search for the truth, they can march the hand in the hand. And uh, not so much for religion. We had in our civilization uh, the famous case of uh, Galileo, who was a strong believer, actually all scientists in his period were a strong believer, even Newton, even Darwin in the beginning, Kepler. And uh, however, they found uh, themselves in, uh, in 
difficulty with religion just because of this written code. And here with Galileo began a schism between religion and science in the sense that since that time they were not so always not so well in harmony. And this uh, disharmony was uh, <coughs> increased by a philosopher, very famous one, René Descartes, is <coughs> the philosopher who is kept responsible for our division between body and mind for <coughs> over 250 years. He was the one who uh, decisively said that uh, science uh, should occupy itself with the rest extensive, with the thing, with the thing that he can measure and uh, value and transform possibly in uh, a question, whereas science should ignore all what today we would call qualia, simply ignore the subjectivity, the uh, the, the, the thing which have to do with the soul. And so the schisma between science and religion also because of uh, Cartesio became very strong and uh, with Cartesio and then up to this handsome uh, young man uh, Isaac Newton, science became uh, very mechanistic and very uh, reductionist mechanist in the sense that the world was seen as an ensemble of things composed by parts which could be decomposed one from the other and you study a piece of this ensemble in all detail you study another piece and then you put all together and you pretend to have uh, the knowledge of the ensemble and uh, this kind of uh, reductionist, mechanistic uh, point of view of science has been very successful and responsible for all the technical success that we have conceived uh, until now. But entering, entered in a profound crisis in the beginning of last century, mostly uh, due to quantum mechanics, but simply also due to the Maxwell and his theory uh, of field and um, in the middle of uh, last century this decline of the mechanistic reductionistic view was due also to a series of new concepts which came out in uh, science and which made the new fields based on the actually uh, as we will see in opposition to uh, the mechanistic world. Terms like self-organization, complexity, non-linearity, imagined properties, linearity, chaos, and uh, out of equilibrium, uh, fractal system thinking. And I put here that almost uh, at the same time arose in many scientists, mostly at the beginning, the scientists of the quantum mechanics, a kind of lay spirituality, maybe one should not say lay, spiritu lay spirituality, spirituality, but I, I mean with this term people who are not monks, who are not uh, professional uh, teacher of uh, uh, any uh, uh, oriental uh, spirituality, but people like Einstein who just uh, studying science touch these uh, as, as of smell of infinite, of mystery, the mystery of nature and so that science become at the same time uh, the contemplation or the feeling of something that you cannot uh, comprehend completely and of which you admire mostly the mystery. So science touching the mystery and touching then 
as uh, Albert Einstein says here, the uh, mysteries of eternity, of life, or the marvelous structure of reality. Now, in this period, uh, there is the birth of the quantum mechanics, and uh, we have learned and uh, how many concepts this kind of uh, physics has brought with us, which has really over our mind. You know, once upon a time, physics was something sensible and uh, uh, with common sense, and nowadays with uh, the entanglement, with the uh, particles which do not exist anymore because they are strings of vibration energy and with the undetermination principle and with the electron which are not electron but a cloud of probability it's something which uh, cannot be uh, grasped anymore by our simple mind so science reached this point and then uh, when you reach the point that mind cannot follow where are you? Are you in science or you are already in some metaphysical uh, stage? Uh, and uh, one could say that the study of quantum mechanics is already a study of uh, spirituality in the sense that it really uh, tackles the question what is reality in its most profound way and uh, what is me also because uh, quantum mechanics wants the observer in the picture which complicates enormously the notion and the activity of science and there are other things this, in the study of those people who study the parallel universe it's already a form of spirituality and quantum mechanics is really the uh, mind-blowing uh, activity in terms of science, but science today is still molecular science. If you open any science or nature or proceeding academy of science, uh, whatever important scientific journal you want to read, you only almost only find the uh, article on DNA, RNA, uh, proteins, uh, genes, and uh, receptor, enzymes, molecules, molecules, and molecules, molecules are also the things that uh, feed uh, the pharma industry, the, the petrol industry, the all the uh, synthetic biology industry so that uh, science today at least judging from what is going on in the market and in, in the journals is has to do still with uh, molecular and we will deal with uh, this kind of system view of life, which is a new way of looking at uh, the science, mostly the science of uh, uh, the molecules, the science of uh, life. And uh, I think I will talk about the system view also because of this book, which I have uh, written uh, with uh, Frisch of Capra a couple of years ago, which is still being translated in different languages. The system view is the opposite of the mechanistic reductionist view of Newman and uh, Descartes as it states that when you have a system composed by several parts like an organism or uh, like a watch or like uh, a hospital social system like a common mark, so many parts, the important feature of this ensemble uh, cannot be ascribed to the property of, the, of each isolated component, 
but they are due to the interaction, to the bonds which connect all these parts. So when you have a system uh, with many points, just forget the point and take all the lines which connect all these uh, com components and is the mutual interaction of all components which give the all properties of life, biological life, social life, economic, ecological life. I want to give you some example before jumping into our uh, uh, notion of uh, the, this book you have seen costs a lot of money, 30 is a 600 page, 30 euro, but in India uh, you find an edition for only ten dollars a day, but that's close to my business. So if you have something complex like that and you have wings and uh, you have uh, eyes and you have a gelatinous body and you have little and all these things, how all these things know that they belong to the same entity? It's not that the heart can beat you know, at the speed it wants without taking care of all what other organs are doing. It's just like an orchestra where you have the players who have to be in symphony with each other and none of them can do his own business. Life, organic life, social life is generally of always made by interaction of parts and all parts must be in contact with each other in order to determine the unity. And this is the main message of the systemic thinking. Then in these organs with time happens to the best of us due to some, due some age or accident, some of these bones break and uh, you arrive at a point, they say for everybody, I hope that they're wrong, but probably not the point of death, where you still have all organs which may be active for a few minutes uh, or a few hours, but they are not anymore interacting with each other. That is the picture of fragmentation. Life is when you have all talking together and if you ask one of your students, here is a living horse jumping around and there is a dead horse who just died right now and the dead horse has all proteins, all DNA, all blood, all hormones, uh, all nerves of the living horse. So why do you call it dead if he has everything? And the smart uh, students say, well, professor, this is the living horse where all parts, all organs, talk and interact with each other. Life is an integrated uh, property. And this is your dead horse where the liver and kidneys and lung don't talk anymore with each other. So this is the general truth that life the same in a hospital where you have the interaction between the doctor, the nurse, the accountant and the director. And the same is true in, uh, in the common market if you look at the uh, interaction of the different uh, countries. I mentioned life and death but I close immediately parenthesis because it will be a long talk. Because talking about science and religion, the question of death is indeed a controversy. I, as a scientist interested in the origin of life, I had many dialogues with uh, priests and uh, men of uh, religion about life, what is life. And 
we could often find an agreement. But on the question of death, science and uh, religion don't find an agreement. There, there is a profound uh, schism, which I think will never be uh, uh, overwhelmed. As uh, science says, with the death, you know, the individual disappears. There are molecules which are reshuffled and used up again for other, but uh, nothing remain of the individual and religion with soul or re re reincarnation and uh, say general the opposite. But let's uh, go ahead and asking <coughs> there is this system thinking of all where all things uh, all part of the system interact with each other to make uh, something complex and functioning. This is true for a, my body. Somebody can say, this is true also for a watch or for an automobile. So what is the difference between uh, you and an automobile in terms of this interaction? And so I come to the question of <coughs> what is life, which will bring us to our closer to spirituality. To understand what is life, look at this simple cartoon which represents the cross-section of a cell. All life on earth is cellular. Where there is life, there are cells and only cells. And cells are spherical things here in cross-section, characterized by a so-called membrane which in delineate the inside from the outside, semi-permeable, uh, uh, some nutrient and energy come inside something else. Yeah. And importantly, there are many, many transformations inside. Uh, sugar being burned, proteins being de degraded, uh, uh, polysaccharide being hydrolyzed, uh, hormones being synthesized, think that in each of your liver cells there are in this moment perhaps 10,000 transformations going on. But, and this is the characteristic of life, at the same time the liver cell remains, stays like the liver cell, does not change. And an amoeba remains an amoeba despite the 10,000 transformation in second. And an elephant remains an elephant for a long observation time, forgetting the aging, despite the million of chemical transformation. How is this <coughs> absurdity possible that there is so many changes and then there is the maintenance of the self? And this is the most uh, important signature of life, that the cell maintains itself, self-maintenance, despite the enormous number of transformation, thanks to a process of <coughs> regeneration from within. We took one kilogram of these uh, things in our guts who helps digestion. But the important things is the following, that each of these points is a chemical compound and each line is a chemical transformation and chemical reaction. Each reaction is catalyzed, as we say in chemistry, by a big protein called enzyme. And so you see what happens inside that little micro. And actually, if you look, each of these compounds, uh, there is a co-dependent arising. Life is not localized. Life is not localizable. Or you can say the Buddhist view would give you an entire uh, 
life, but then from that you can go to the next one, to the interaction, and from that to the uh, ecology, and from that uh, to the entire planet, and from that to the atmosphere, and from that to the uh, other star, and had then a kind of uh, chain of causality. And causality is indeed the central pillar of philosophical Buddhism. And, uh, and you say in Buddhism, but you say the same in the system work, there is this because there is that, there is the tree because there is the seed, but uh, there, because there is the sun, because there is the rain, because there is the water, because there is the farmer, and there is the farmer because there is his parents, and there are his parents because there are the people who give you them food, and uh, so that you get to a, a kind of uh, uh, network which involve the all things that you can think of. But here there is another slide, let's see. And now consider the cumulative effect of uh, two complement concept. And I say that for, for, for Buddhism, the same is valid for our system view of life namely the complementarity between this codependent rising that each element depends from all the others at the same time there is the impermanence the fluctuation something that uh, stay for a few seconds disappear is formed again so all is a fluctuation of things then you reach uh, this uh, conclusion this view that the entire universe is not made by isolated independent things but is a dynamic totally interactive process now this is uh, easy to write but it's also easy to reach on the basis of uh, science but this is not a small thing because as soon as you say that uh, science and the system thinking as well as Buddhism take you to a chain of mutually causally mutually dependent things which embrace all what there is then you are in touch with the whole with the totality and then you are in touch with the infinite as Einstein was saying before and actually this type of consideration is also present in uh, Advaita Vedanta uh, here is uh, Shankara uh, which however uh, is not so popular among scientists as Buddhism is uh, this is interesting I have been for many years since 1997 in Mind and Life this institution created by the Dalai Lama and Francisco Varela for the confluence between science and uh, Buddhism and I have seen many many scientists interested in Buddhism profoundly mostly because in Buddhism is a philosophy or reason uh, you reach this kind of conclusion without mentioning God and without mentioning any transcendent uh, power whereas in uh, Shankara and Advaita Vedanta although there is this beautiful idea of the all the, you immediately are confronted with, uh, with uh, Brahma and uh, Vishnu uh, probably not so in the old Veda part but in, in the, when you talk with uh, modern Advaita Vedanta people immediately come God and all the... But this is another beautiful uh, expression of uh, Shankara. 
like bubbles in water, the world rise exist and dissolve in the supreme self. But there is this always this notion of supreme self. So we have to reach this conclusion that uh, Buddhism sees reality as a web of causal interaction. And the same can be said for a system view of life. Uh, is there is nothing which can stand by itself. I have pollution my little uh, pond in the garden. This is uh, giving problem to the atmosphere. The atmosphere is connected with the sun. The sun with the solar system, it's all connected with each other. Then we arrive at the all as a gigantic dynamic network. And when you are there and you smell the whole, um, you are already touching. You have a taste of the infinite, of the mystery, as Einstein was saying before. Uh, however, you know, talking about spirituality, until now I have used only my mind, my, my intellect. So this is something interesting. You arrive at the notion of totality, which touch upon the mystery and about the eternity, about all what you want that your mind does not comprehend, but you arrive at this point using only the reason. So where do we go from here? Somebody would say, well, if you want spirituality, then you have to jump. You know, to have to, I don't know, go to an ashram or sit in a cave, and jump into another reality. But some other sage would say, you stand at the edge, you're ready to throw yourself in. What a shock to discover <clears throat> there is nowhere to go and no one to through this uh, kind of Zen uh, answer, but I think many sage would answer this way. And we have somehow to put in uh, the notion of uh, <coughs> subjectivity of consciousness to make the, <coughs> the story a little more complete. And uh, we are as scientist but as normal person with our mind structured in such a way that there is always an eye watching the outside. There is this uh, dichotomy between the self, the eye and the outside. And so that the I, the first person, is generally never capable to be in the picture because it's the one who observes cannot be inside and actually this is the big problem of uh, consciousness for science. Many <coughs> philosophers consider consciousness as a blind spot because you cannot study it because uh, studying consciousness is already an act of consciousness okay. and uh, on the other hand, there is no explanation, no cause could appear without consciousness already being there as a precondition. So when our neurophysiologists, neurobiologists say consciousness is this uh, in the brain, or is it, uh, this is clearly, well, I would say almost a nonsense, because in order to talk about the brain, you have to have the consciousness of the brain and not what the brain does. And you can use several of these. Uh, and therefore, a sense of phenomenon can be observed, studied, or explained if and only if consciousness is already there. It's impossible to regard consciousness as a product of something. It cannot be secondary. And uh, this is in the literature, but this is, gives a lot of problem. Uh, even nowadays, there are several meetings on consciousness, and we never reach a clear agreement. Many scientists do not accept this principle that uh, consciousness is primary. 
They like to think, but particularly the neuroscientists, that consciousness is secondary, is a product of something, of the matter, of the brain in particular, which I don't believe, I don't share, and many others don't. But then, if we have this situation where the world is uh, described as a third person description, he does that and uh, there is the mountain and there is the river. And on the other hand there is the subjective description. So these two words, it appears that the universe is made out in two parts. One material, the world outside there, and the other, all what is inside me, and all what inside me is also the world, it has been put into my subjectivity by all perception and all other uh, senses I have. But, and here is the uh, $100,000 question, isn't so that uh, these two different forms, this apparent uh, dichotomy is due to our limited intellect, which is unable to comprehend the completeness of uh, two opposite ways. And uh, there is this so-called non-dualistic view, which is shared by a few philosophers and a few uh, uh, scholars of, uh, science, of uh, consciousness, as our common experience tells us that there are two opposite aspects of reality. On the one hand, the object, the content, and the other, the consciousness. And if you think for a second, this is really our constant uh, situation. Now, you can accept the, the idea that uh, there are no two reality cannot be two, there must be one, but uh, there are two because uh, of the limitedness of our intellect. As a way of conclusion, I, I could say, I have said that science and spirituality may proceed the hand in the hand, about reaching the wonder, which is the real threshold. For all scientists like Bohr or uh, Schrodinger or Oppenheimer or uh, Einstein, they always use this word wonder, you know, meaning you cannot go farther. The smell of totality, of the mysteries of the infinite, and uh, how you go farther from this wonder which is at the limit between intellect and something else is really your business, your life. I can give, tell you how this friend of us, this problem of the ratio between the I, the individual, and the infinite. I'm saying, this is my last slide, uh, 50 years ago about, a human being is a part of a whole called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thought and feeling as something separate from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us. Our task must be to free ourselves from the prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures of the all of nature in its beauty. Yes, now we'll go on with the questions. Material world uh, corresponding to Asiya in uh, Kabbalah, in the Kabbalah tradition, yeah. and then three more worlds above this Asiya world. Now, if you are looking at 
a human being as consisting of all these worlds, then the conclusion that once you die, everything is gone, is only true for the material world, but there are still parts of your human being above this material world that persist and may reincarnate again and may live and mature further. The question, of course, I mean, is is this true or is can, can you can you comment on this? I mean, that's to a certain point, they don't accept, they don't believe generally reincarnation. This to me was the threshold to see whether one was really, uh, you know, became a Buddhist or not. And the large majority of scientists would simply deny and do not accept the notion of reincarnation. So it does not belong to science. It may belong to something which is even more important than science, but in terms of science as it is now, even considering the modern quantum mechanic, which is the most bizarre way of thinking, which includes even the possibility of multiverse, many universes, you know, different, the, there is nothing like reincarnation or soul which is considered uh, uh, seriously by science. So I would not put that in my science uh, container. Of course, I mean, science would apply only to this ASEA world, you know, to the, to the most, yes. to the material world. It would simply not apply to all the other worlds, you know. But the question if these other worlds exist, I mean, yeah. outside of science is still valid, you know, and still important. Well, it's maybe important, but science has no proof for that. Yes. And, uh, and you see, I keep saying always that science is a very limited portion of the human enterprise. It has small things, but it has its very strong uh, framework because being so small has rather rigid uh, borders and uh, nobody obliges you to be a scientist but if you are a scientist you want to be a science you have to wear this uh, 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 jacket of you know reproducibility etc 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 which uh, makes science boring and small um, perhaps without fantasy but also the strength that brings us ahead because if everything goes into science then it's a big chaos and uh, it's not uh, useful anymore thank you we have other questions over there okay with uh, windows 7 on it yeah so you install it on one computer that was blind before mm -hmm. So you work on this computer, but then shit happens, you know, it happens. Uh, you spill a coffee on it, so computer is dead. Well, computer is dead, but you take the same CD and install the same Windows 7 on another computer. Is it reincarnation of Windows 7? No, it's nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> it's just an accident. No, I mean from the perspective that you install the same software, but on another material entity. So, it, it seems like it's a new physical entity, but the software is the same that it's no, installed on it. You know, there is something which we call metaphor, which is a very important uh, literature figure in science and literature. I tell to my lady, you are warm as the sun. It's a beautiful metaphor, but if I want to cook an egg, an, an eye on hair, you know, this is a nonsense. So the metaphor is fine, and uh, so to see this uh, as an incarnation is simply a, a play of words, what I would call a metaphor, and not nothing more serious than that. You know, by which birds find the, the right direction, and uh, it's part uh, of this uh, new way of looking at nature in terms of uh, system thinking and the birds which fly it's a kind of complexity because it's a collective which fly there is not 
a partner or a, a chef which guides the birds. It's really, a, you know... Is there a morphogenetic field? Uh, those are words of Sheldrake, whom I like as a person, very good friend, but uh, it's again to me a, a metaphor. But, you know, to talk about uh, uh, a, a system, uh, uh, thinking system, view for a collective, like a beehive, you know, each bee moves, does not know what the single B does. But, you know, all together you look and you see a very uh, well-organized system. So where does this organization come? Not from the will of the single B, but from kind of a collective uh, system, which I, as a biologist, explain in genetic terms. You know, the, the bees have, uh, they don't know it, but they construct something according to a genetic order. But they don't know it, so each is... And so this vision of uh, a collective uh, uh, organism which moves as an entity and works as an entity, although the single do not know, it's a very powerful figure of our modern science, man and chimpanzee. Those are the only animals which are capable of, you know, coming together and planning cold-bloodedly the killing of somebody else. Lions kill, but only for, you know, defense. And this uh, the genetic determinant is with us because man from the very beginning had no you know, nothing to defend uh, himself and the only way to eat and to defend himself was to kill. And uh, it's, uh, it's a sad reality, but I believe that will be very difficult to counteract this kind of genetic trait of humanity, which is uh, you know, many beautiful things, love for, you know, spirituality and love for beauty and harmony and consciousness, all the wonderful things that we did with art. At the same time, we have this uh, black series of genes uh, and uh, it's really a fight. And what we have to do in the future is make so that the the part which uh, has to do with uh, the strength of positive consciousness takes over more and more. But to hope that it disappears is probably in. Yeah. But so, to actually go forward with, with, in this direction, it would be to actually create something that connects all of us beyond regardless of race, nationality, ethnicity, and it's actually a chance to connect the dots, you know? Yeah, it's a connection, but it's a connection operated by mankind in itself. This, uh, with all kind of technology, you can, you can use to better aims or uh, you can use to, to do hard. And again, you know, man is as the one and the other. And I believe, unfortunately, it will be very difficult to have only one. I mean, Asimov wants to have proposes that all humanity is controlled by a supercomputer and managed. Yeah, that's uh, science fiction. I don't. <laughs> comment on. Of course, uh, you know, there is even some people who think that uh, we are not real, we are all in a uh, kind of... Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for all the questions and all the answers, Professor. Um, I think this is a word and a pause for... Uh, 60, 60 minutes, one hour, and we can use and have some.